Hey everybody, thank you for joining us this week for our online services. We're so glad that you are a part of our church family. For those of you who are new, you can get some information sent right to your phone by texting RVCF to the number 97000. You can also get information from us by signing up for our weekly e-blast. You can download the RVCF app on the Google Play Store or on the Apple App Store. Uh, you can also follow us on Instagram, all right? And you can also follow us on, like us on Facebook. Uh, we'd love for you to do that. Speaking of Facebook, this week we want to let you know that we are trying to collect uh, resources for Bradley East Elementary kids. Uh, as they are getting ready to start school, we're wanting to be able to collect uh, those school supplies for them. So if you, if you would like to be a part of that, you can find the list right there on our Facebook page. And you can go on, you can, get those, you can get those resources and you can bring those to the church. We'd love for you to do that so that we can get those to the families uh, that are in need. So we'd love for you to do that. Uh, thanks again for joining us today. Let's take a few minutes and worship together. We're heaven's creations, His pride in adoration, treasures woven by His love. His careful hands, they hold us safe within His promise of calling and of destiny.
Good morning, River Valley Christian Fellowship. Thank you for joining us online today. Again, we want to tell you about some exciting news next week on August 23rd, Sunday at 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. We will be having our first indoor worship services since like March. Okay, so we would invite all of you to come. Uh, you can see a list of our protocols that we will be following for these services on our website at myrvcf.org. Please go there. We look forward to seeing you again in our North venue for all three services. You don't have to come to all three services, but we'll be having all three services in the North venue. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. For those of you that are comfortable joining us in person. For those of you that are not, uh, please understand we'll be offering these online services uh, for you to stay connected with us and to worship with us. Well, last week we began a new series called Unshaken as we walk through Paul's letter to the Philippians. Now, as I was thinking about this, I think this letter is a letter that we need right now as we ask this very important question. How do we live, as Paul says, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ so that we stand firm, unshaken, not frightened, striving side by side with the church as the church as a witness for Christ in a world filled with all kinds of uncertainty. As disciples of Jesus, what does it look like when we are resolved not to allow uncertainty of a pandemic and economic challenges and division to steal our joy? What does it look like to have a gentle answer and to be patient with others? What does it look like to exhibit love and self-control when faced with opposition? These are important questions right now. And it turns out that the most basic Christian behaviors is becoming somewhat novel in our society. I mean, who knew that it would be groundbreaking to be kind to one another? And, and who knew we would need justification beyond Jesus' teaching to love one another? When you read the letter to the Philippians, you can't help but notice that Paul is looking through another lens with different priorities. His priority was not based on his own safety, but on the salvation of others. And while others were looking at his imprisonment with negativity and also what it would mean, not only for him, but what it would mean for them, they were becoming discouraged, perhaps, and afraid. But Paul, he sees things completely different. And what he sees is something bigger and something better, something to rejoice in. Paul exudes with joy and confidence. And quite honestly, sometimes we don't know what to make of it. But we wonder in this moment, is it possible even now during this great disruption to our lives to restore our confidence and joy in the same way Paul had restored while he was in prison? And the answer, of course, is absolutely yes. But we're going to need a different lens. We're going to need a different lens to look through this uncertainty through. See, unfortunately, the predominant lens I see many Christians using to discern this disruptive season is a political lens. Now, we all know this, don't we? That a political lens is a weak and faulty lens for many reasons. But one of those is, well, it relies on the wisdom of ourselves, which is precarious at best. The pol political lens is always changing. People change, platforms change. The political lens is misplaced trust. Putting our ultimate trust in a political means is a lesson in futility. You know what, I, I think Solomon might call this political lens, I think he might call it hevel. You remember what hevel means? It's a Hebrew term meaning something that's fleeting, like smoke or vapor. It's here one moment and it's gone the next. No, Paul had a better lens to view uncertainty and disruption, a perspective that left him unshaken. So if you have your Bibles, I would love for you to turn with me to the letter to the Philippians and beginning at verse 12, verse 12 of chapter one of Philippians. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. 
And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Now let me remind you that the year that Paul writes this is around the year 62 AD. And Paul has been brought to Rome. He's been put under house arrest. His journey to Rome began some four years ago when Paul was accused of bringing a Gentile into a part of the temple in Jerusalem that was only reserved to Jew, for Jews. He was arrested there and then taken to Caesarea where he was in prison for a couple of years. And then he began what, what we see in, in the book of Acts as a very adventurous uh, trip to Rome. But now he's there and it's here that Paul receives a visitor from his favorite church in Philippi. His name was Epaphroditus, and Epaphroditus brings a gift from the church to Paul, and he brings news from the church that Paul so desperately loved. Now, based on what we read in verse 12, Epaphroditus must have shared with Paul about the church's perspective on Paul's imprisonment in Rome. They may have been looking through a lens that only saw Paul's imprisonment as a loss, it's really too bad, they may say. If Paul would have only not gone to Jerusalem and gotten in trouble, this wouldn't have happened. Or they may have been saying, there's so much opportunity to plant other churches and for the gospel to advance around the empire. And, and yet here's Paul's in prison. His ministry must be over now. They may have also been concerned about their own situation in Philippi. We have to remember that Philippi was a Roman city it was focused on nationalism and the worship of Caesar. And when they brought the message that Jesus, not Caesar, was actually Lord, it brought a lot of attention and opposition. They may have been asking, what would Paul's imprisonment in Rome mean for them? Will this lead to widespread persecution of Christians? Could they find themselves making the same trip to Rome as Paul did? So Paul wants to make very clear to them that his imprisonment was not a loss, as they may expect, but a gain. God was reversing the expectations of what would seem to be natural. The gospel was, in fact, not in jeopardy of being lost. It was advancing. The lens that Paul was looking through at his uncertain situation was this. God can use what seem like losses and turn them to gains. Paul knew that the crucifixion of Jesus looked like a defeat as he was nailed to the cross and dying a criminal's death. But what could not be seen was that Jesus was taking upon himself every sin for us, receiving our judgment of sin in our place, so that in his death, forgiveness of sin and new life in his kingdom could begin. See, what looked like a defeat on the cross of Jesus was actually a glorious victory. Paul's confidence and hope in Christ and the sovereignty of God was weaved into every dark, uncertain situation that he faced. Paul knew that in God's economy, what seemed to not add up, God uses for his purposes. Not in spite of our trials, but in fact, through our trials. Maybe you've heard of this. In the Middle Ages, there was a practice developed called alchemy. Now, this was an attempt to find the secret that could turn lead and other base metals into gold. The desire was to take something that appeared useless and make it valuable, and of course, make themselves rich in the process. They never found this secret, of course, but spiritually, Paul, in fact, did. See, unlike us, Paul didn't expect to see the whole picture. But from what he could see, he knew this. God can take what seems to us as useless and purposeless and random and turn it into gold. This is the lens we need. One thing among 
many things this pandemic and our response to it is teaching us is that we do not have the power to turn this season into gold. God is the one who's the alchemist, and we have to trust him. Turn with me to verse 12 again, and let's read it together. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. Now, Paul's ultimate priority and his ultimate concern during his imprisonment and his whole ministry was the progress of the gospel. The gospel is a word that he uses nine times in this letter. He also uses phrases like word, speak the word, and preach Christ, and proclaim Christ, each referring to the gospel. But let me not assume that you know what the gospel is. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul restated the gospel of first importance, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day and appeared well, to a bunch of people, including Paul himself. The gospel is good news. Good news. We have to rem remember that we have sinned against a holy God. We've been separated from him and deserving his judgment and wrath. And yet the good news is that Jesus paid in full the debt that we owe God. Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection make reconciliation with God and a new life possible. The gospel is news of an event. It was this news that captured the heart of Paul as the resurrected Jesus appeared to him on a trip as he was on his way to persecute Christians who believed this very message. Paul was changed forever and he gave his life to proclaim this news and planting churches all across the Roman Empire. The gospel of King Jesus was the driving message of Paul. It was this message that led him to be beaten and stoned and betrayed and have multiple imprisonments. Paul knew the power of the gospel because it was the power that he experienced in his own life. Let me ask you this. Do you know the power of the gospel? Have you forgotten the gospel of first importance? Have we drifted into an assumption of the gospel that has become secondary to a pragmatic and therapeutic approach to the Christian life? Has the good news of Jesus ceased to be good news and captivate your attention like it once did? Well, this summer, I had the privilege uh, to hear the story of someone who had a powerful encounter with God and was saved in the middle of this pandemic. Though growing up in church, he really never knew the grace of God. He only knew the judgment of God, but not the saving grace of God. Through a series of events at his work that could really only be seen as an orchestration of God, he was given some recordings by a fellow co-worker. And these recordings were of a pastor who died many years ago, but he put that recording on as he drove in his truck and while he's traveling through the mountains of Georgia, he listened intently to this pastor proclaim the love of God through Jesus. He said, as he listened intently to this teaching about the love and grace of God, he fell under the powerful conviction of the Spirit. He said, I couldn't drive any longer. He pulled off the road and there, alone in his truck, he felt under the grip of God until God gave him release. Through tears, he shared the freedom that he had found in Christ. This is the power of the gospel, the same gospel that gripped Paul's life. Paul says, even in his imprisonment, that the gospel has been advanced. I want you to notice verses 12 and 13. He says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Do you see this? At first, he says the gospel was advancing through the imperial guard and to all the rest. The imperial guard, 9,000 soldiers based in Rome. Paul was chained to a guard 24 hours a day. 
He had no privacy, no freedom, no conveniences. Paul had a captive audience chained to him every day. Can you imagine Paul saying to, to his guard, look, you may think that I'm chained to you, but you're actually chained to me. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you how your colleagues crucified this Jesus some 30 years ago and how after being buried, he rose from the dead and he appeared to me also. Soldiers in the Imperial Guard were hearing the gospel and putting their faith in Christ. It's amazing, isn't it? Paul was witness to the power of the gospel taking root in their lives. Notice, he also says that the gospel was advancing to all the rest. It seems these guards were taking and talking about the gospel. Like a, a, a rock dropped in water causing ripple effect. The rock of the gospel was dropped into the place that Paul was held in prison. And this ripple effect was being felt across the whole imperial guard. Second, the gospel was also advancing among other Christians. Notice verse 14. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul says that his imprisonment had inspired others to share the gospel fearlessly and boldly. Where once these believers may have been timid to speak about their faith in public, now, like Peter and John after Pentecost, could not help but speak what they had seen and heard. Notice what's happening in Rome. Paul, the apostle and evangelist, is in prison. He cannot go to the agora, the marketplace, to debate with the philosophers in Rome as he had done in Athens. He, he cannot go to the synagogues to share with the Jews there that Jesus is a fulfillment of all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. He can't go to his fellow gatherings of his fellow Christians to worship with them and encourage them there. This would be like trying to play baseball with your hands tied behind your back. And though Paul's voice was only heard in the place that he was being held, the gospel was advancing through multiplied voices of other Christians and remarkably within the imperial guard as well. Again, this is God's math. Subtract one and not multiply dozens. The gospel was advancing through his imprisonment, but it was also advancing through opposition. Notice verse 15 and following. He says, he writes there, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Now, we have to remember that there was a church in Rome long before Paul arrived there. There were already the establishment of leaders in the church at Rome who taught the scriptures and discipled the believers. But it seems that when the buzz of Paul's arrival was made known, these leaders may have felt a little threatened. And maybe they didn't agree with Paul on every point, which they wanted to make known to everyone who was listening. So to reestablish themselves and to re reclaim their positions, they also began preaching the gospel more boldly, yet while undermining Paul at the same time. These were not false teachers that Paul is talking about, or Paul would have called them out. No, these were teachers proclaiming the gospel correctly, but with mixed motives. He said that they were attempting to make his captivity worse. You can't help but see, can you, that Paul may seem more hurt by these fellow Christians than he is the Roman guards. Some of you may have felt the sting of betrayals from other believers. These wounds sometimes can really hurt. Sometimes they hurt more than the wounds from unbelievers. Sometimes the church doesn't love like it should. We hurt one another, we let each other down. We are still being sanctified. But this doesn't paralyze Paul nor does he use it as a reason to become bitter. No, in, even in the face of opposition, Paul had reason to be confident and unshaken. Why? Notice what he says in verse 18. What then, he asks, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Paul was still rejoicing because the gospel was being proclaimed. 
No matter how it was being proclaimed, Paul was happy that it was being proclaimed. Everywhere Paul looked, he could see the gospel advancing through his imprisonment, through the imperial guard, through fellow believers, even teachers with mixed motives. Nothing could stop the gospel. And in this, he rejoiced. The gospel was advancing, not in perfect circumstances or through perfect people but through broken circumstances and broken people. And this is exactly the kind of conditions in which God does his best work. Now, there may be many things that are stopping during the season. Events are stopping, concerts are stopping, sports are stopping. But the gospel of most importance will continue to advance as the gospel continues to advance in us. See, when the gospel of Jesus advances in each of us, our faith makes progress and the gospel advances around us. I want you to notice something in this passage that Paul doesn't minimize the situation. He doesn't ignore it, nor does, is he consumed by it. Remember, he's using his trial to encourage the Philippians in their own trials. He wants them to use the same lens that he's using. He wants them to see what he can see. God is taking what seem like losses and he's turning them into gains. See, this is a reminder we need during this pandemic. Like Paul, we shouldn't minimize the difficulty this has been for many of us. Some of us have been sick with COVID-19. Some have been laid off from jobs. I've spoken to widows over the last few months who have felt isolated and lonely and missed the gathering of the church. This week I spoke to Dwight. Many of you know who Dwight is who attend River Valley. He's from our ministry for adults with disabilities called Manifest. He lives in a group home that's still locked down and he misses his church family so badly. This separation has been very difficult for him. See, I, I feel for the administrators and teachers and parents and students that are getting ready to go to school this week. Everyone is making difficult decisions with the information that's in front of them. And no one knows what lies ahead. And we don't know when it's going to end. So the answer is not to overlook the difficulty, nor is the answer to be consumed by our difficulty. Paul never does this. Instead, the Lord wants to encourage us today that we can be confident and unshaken in prolonged uncertainty. Why? Because our faith rests not in a political solution or favorable circumstances, but in the risen King Jesus, who can take what seems like a loss and turn it to gold. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, that you are present with us in these moments, difficulties, uncertainties. Father, you are always there. And sometimes when you seem most absent, you are most at work in our lives. So God, I pray that through your Holy Spirit, we would feel this work. We would feel the confidence in your work in us even now. Lord, I pray like Paul that we would trust in your sovereign work. I pray, Father, that when we can't understand it, when it seems useless and when it seems like it's purposeless, help us to trust you that even then you're turning us to gold. You're turning our situation into gold. Lord, we're grateful today. We're grateful for Paul's writing in Philippians. I, I thank you for the confidence that he has, the hope that he has in you. May we have this same confidence brought about through the gospel, the good news in our lives. And may we not only have confidence in it, but God, may we share it. May it be advancing in our own life. Father, we thank you that in these difficult moments, our trust is not misplaced when our trust is in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Touching every heart, I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. Cause you are way maker, miracle worker. Promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Yeah, you are the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, yeah, you are way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when I don't see it you're working even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working
Hey everybody, thank you again for joining us for worship and, and as we continue on in this series. We're so glad that you've joined us. If you would like to give to the mission of River Valley so that we can continue doing these things, we can continue to reach our community, uh, we would love for you to go to our website, myrvcf.org slash give. And you can do that giving there or you could send a check to the church, 800 Cardinal Drive, Bourbonnet. Again, thank you so much. Have a great week. And we look forward to seeing you next week in person in the North Venue for Inside Services. Have a great week.